Fred was a sugarcane farmer in Brisbane, Queensland. Um, he went broke, probably in the Depression, I suppose, and he blames the government, which was probably fair enough. He, yeah, he, what he told me was that he met with a woman called I, Ioni. Ioni? Um, he did say at one stage that she was not an Earth person, she was an alien, and she taught him a lot of things about the future, what the future holds for the planet, and what we must do to protect our planet. And she said that he must take the message to mankind and alert mankind to the dangers of what this world faces and of what may happen in the future. And she showed him the charts, gave him a set of charts, and told him that he would be guided to meet up with someone who thought like him, and together they would they would form a group. Now, um, that, I presume, was when he came to West Australia. He didn't have any place in mind, but one day, as he said to me, he said, oh, I, I thought, well, maybe I'll go to West Australia, see what happens over there. And there was, but it was, all the trains are booked out, but there was a vacancy, so he hopped straight on the train and came to West Australia. And he came to a meeting... Doctor, a, there was a little place, a little group in Murray Street in Perth. At one stage, when mum, mum and dad hadn't got on well for a long time, and then eventually the decision came that mum and dad would get divorced and mum would marry Fred. At that point, I think we thought, well, what we should do to get rid of Fred, we should do something and <laughs> get rid of Fred. But I mean, we didn't. We, we still got on fine with Fred and we didn't do anything. <laughs> and he used to come up to the farm and, with mum and visit like dad and everyone up there. There was no no bad feelings. I mean, Dad got on fine with Fred, you know, no problem. Everyone got on fine with Fred, he was harmless. He never really organised anything. He wasn't an organising person. He was a like a philosopher, a prophet. Um, he talked with conviction. He um, when he was when he was when he was lecturing, he he was very influ influential, very convincing. But other times he was just an easygoing sort of guy that didn't know any harm, you know, he was great. Fred was wonderful. Um, I used to call Fred the prophet. He was a real visionary. He could inspire anyone. They'd come in off the street and he'd sit there and he'd tell you about his spiritual journey, his experiences, and of course his strong connection with the notion of um, beings from other planets and other worlds who were assisting in the process of human evolution. Um, I was always moved by Fred because I was moved by the story of a, of a very conservative sort of British farmer who the depression made him rethink his whole existence and step right out of the whole materialistic worldview and actually start to ask deeper questions about the purpose of life, why we're here, what's going on. And Fred, when I knew him, was well in his 90s. I mean, I think he was 93 or 94 when he died. And I spent many a night talking with Fred, driving Fred around and... He was, without any question of doubt, he was a real prophet, a real visionary. He had a, a vision for a future in which there was equity, there was social justice, there was a sense of harmony, you know, very much. And behold, there should be a new heaven and a new earth, because that was the sense you got from Fred, that there will be a new heaven and we may be going through temporary periods of dislocation and oppression, but this will not last. This too shall pass. So tell us how you coped. How I coped? Mm -hmm. I think we all cope by doing our best to conform to uh, what they call the group consciousness which was just a kind of a sort of a new age way of, of, of uh, defining the tribe or um, the, the mob, whatever. And it was a very, uh, uh, a very elusive, undefined um, state of being, state of consciousness, this group, this group consciousness thing, which was a kind of a myth 
type of um, goal uh, that was generated basically from Mary and Fred and Santa Claus. Um, Self-identity was something that was uh, not encouraged if it in any way contravened um, what uh, perhaps Mary and Fred perceived to be outside of the uh, interests of their uh, their belief systems, their um, um, their group consciousness again. A lot of the problem was we we became an isolated group of people at times, separate from the larger community, and that was a mistake. Um, there was a there was a cultish type of feel there at times, um, although a lot of us didn't understand it fully until many years into the community, around the mid to late eighties, uh, which was eventually the community community's undoing was people standing on their own two feet and just wanting to be independent and live their own lives, which is what happens to people anyway. <laughs> yeah, when we grow up and um, we stand on our own two feet. So the time the community is like a, was like part of an evolution? Oh, absolutely, yeah, for sure. I mean, when we were in our uh, early 20s, uh, that was the stage we were at. We needed to grow and develop and become independent people. And, and Fred and Mary and Stephen and the people around around us helped me individually to develop that independence, um, so I value that. At the start of me um, looking at the community differently, um, I met Alastair there and, and we were he was already married and I remember <coughs> Mary even said, well, I mean he had to get divorced and all that sort of stuff, but after we were married we went to um, New Zealand and I was pregnant with Jade and it was my first sense of um, we you know there'd been things on the news about people being brainwashed in communities and all that sort of thing but my first sense of, of how we spoke in platitudes um, when people asked us about the community when we went to New Zealand and in New South Wales I was suddenly aware of how we'd spout out all this um, brotherhoodisms, all these brotherhoodisms. Whereas, um, if people just ask us about us, we just talk normally, you know. And 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 that was a really interesting observation. And then, having been away for three and a half months and coming back into the community, I think we were at a different point of view. We had to select certain names if we wanted what we wanted to call our children and they had to be approved and that was all sorts and I thought hang on this is this is getting a bit a bit strange but but as it got more unwieldy too it was like um, the community needed to take another step in its growth you know that encompassed trust a lot of trust and empowering people to actually go off and do things that they were really good at doing for the community but I think because um, it was very hard for the, the central um, management, whatever, to let go of, of that. They really wanted to have control of everything, that it, it was kind of the beginning of the end, really. Fred's inspired the hundreds of young people to look more deeply into themselves and the purpose of their life and what they were doing here. So he, I think he gave a legacy to hundreds of young people, not just who came to the Brotherhood, I might add, but to all over the country where he toured. And he was a pioneer in many ways. I mean, he was into reincarnation, he was into uh, Space Brothers, he was into vegetarianism, and these were all just new words. But, I mean, that's the sort of pioneer energy that, that creates the world today where vegetarianism sort of pass, just passe. Um, the notion of extraterrestrial contact is fairly common among many people. There's no longer the sense that we are the only living beings in the world, universe, I should say. So I think he sowed the seeds that today are quite strong and flourishing trees. I think perhaps the one tree that's probably still fairly weak is this notion of social justice and equity and brotherhood and harmony. We still have quite a way to go towards that. And I think maybe the timeline's a lot longer than Fred thought. But I think somewhere deep within the human psyche there is this longing for a social order, a psychosocial order in which we have peace within and peace without. 
and Fred was able to articulate that in a really inspirational way that could grab the imaginations of people searching in the 70s and he was passionate about it like he really lived it he really believed it he wasn't just one of these gurus to, you know who say one thing and do something else I mean this was his life he really he was believed really this he was, he was a prophet in the in the truest order and a catalyst and he was like all great prophets he had the capacity to inspire others to change their lives radically and he did and he never stopped doing it till the moment that he died I think the most important thing for me was to see the desire of people to create a better life. And in the deepest sense of the word, a lot of the people, in fact the majority of them were middle class youth, they weren't dropouts from fairly affluent families who actually wanted something more meaningful than just more money. And I was moved because there was a sort of real stirring of the human spirit for greater visions of who we can be. It was also, so that inspired me a great deal, which I, in myself, was already aware of. You know, we want to conceive ourselves as egalitarian, as just, as harmonious, as spiritual, as, you know, utopian societies have this vision they grab onto. But the day-to-day -day reality is that that's not where we always are. And there's always conflict, and there's always difficulties, and there's always greed. I mean, it's part of the human condition, this... We have the vision, but we also have the, the shadow side, so to speak. And I think Fred's got caught up in the, that some what, because I think Fred always held on to the vision. And Fred really avoided dealing with the shadow at any time. He didn't want to go there. He just wanted to hang on to the vision. And that meant that his leadership in this community was always fairly tenuous because the real power was the power of those who actually held the day-to-day -day running, the maintenance, who came, who stayed, who was what you were allowed and permitted to do was actually separate from Fred. And who did that power lay? Well, that power lay primarily with his wife, Mary.